Okay, so um, I guess the, the obvious way to start a, a talk about identity is to ask you who you are, who are you? But then I thought I'd give it some more thought and ask you something else. Who do you think you are? Think about that. Now, who do you think the person sitting next to you is? Now, who do you think the person in front of you thinks that the person next to you is? And how do you think that matches how that person sees him or herself? Identity is a messy thing. Identities are complex. We change our identities all the time. We play with our identities. We negotiate our um, identities. We're not the same person when we go to a job interview or when we go out at night and party. We're the same person, but we manage different identities. We choose to show different things about ourselves. And we do, we do this all the time. Our identities are not fixed. They evolve over time, but we also play with them um, every single day. But then, here comes data. Data fixes things. Data creates a piece of something out of something else, and that piece stays. So when things are made stable, they're good for states. States need stability. States relate to you as something that is stable. So we've had IDs or driver licenses or whatever for a long time. States need us to be, to be stable. But what is for a long time we had IDs, there were state databases that related to us as taxpayers or people that went to school. I think that things have been getting out of hand lately. We, before we'd create registries when we start, started a new job, when we pay taxes, when we cross borders, there were moments when we created data and that data went to states, public services. But now we leave digital traces everywhere. We've got loyalty cards for anything, a sports club, a supermarket. We've got credit cards. So everything that we do is stored. Everything that we buy is stored. And where we buy it. We have health cards that, have, that give people access to our health records. So um, whether we have a long-term illness, um, in the future probably our DNA, we have smartphones with lots of applications, geolocalization, every call that we make is recorded, there's people making art with, uh, with that information, there's, uh, that information is being sold to um, third parties that make decisions based on, that, on those pieces of, of data. And we also have um, social media that we use all the time. So not too long ago, our data was limited and fixed and had a purpose. These days, we leave data traces all the time and we have no control of what happens to that data. And this has implications. This has implications because this data gets stored by people that we often don't know. And it's shared with people that we cannot know. We have no way of knowing where our data goes when it goes to a third party. We have no way of knowing. That, the implications of that are, are quite profound. The days when we had a clear threat model are gone. In the past, if you wanted to shield yourself from the state, you knew some of the steps you had to take. In the past, if you wanted to hide from commercial interests, there were certain things you could do. These days, the lines between public and private have been blurred. There's back doors, there's secret programs to exchange data. So the threat model is everything, everywhere, all the time. How do you defend yourself against something that's every, all, all the time there, that you cannot know, that there's no legal tools for you to get to know who your advice, uh, um, adversary is. Also, our data is believed to be the oil of the 21st century. And, and we seem to be in a phase of primitive accumulation. Even though many companies don't know what to do with our data, they just gather it. Because it might be worth something in the future. And giving up on the possibility of money 
later on is quite difficult for most companies. So even though companies and states don't know what to do with most of the data they get on us, they keep it just in case, just in case I can make money of this in the, in the future. And so this data ends up getting a life of its own. It's not just a database, it's not just a number in a database sitting in some, in some storage room. The data creates data doubles, what we call the data doubles, which is you in data. So oftentimes, people, companies, and institutions do not make decisions based on meeting you and talking to you, but they make decisions based on the data that they collect from you and they build a profile, a shadow, a data double. So when you go to a bank, you might think you're sitting down with your banker and telling them about your problems and why you need that loan. Well, actually, the decision that he takes is going to be based on your credit scoring, not how compelling you are in presenting your idea, but your credit scoring, which often comes in the form of um, colors. So the, the banker will see uh, a green light if they're allowed to give you a loan, or a red light if they're not allowed. Often they don't even have access to finding out how that, how that, that decision was, uh, was made. So again, you're trying to create an interaction and the decision has been made uh, beforehand. You go to a job interview and you might think that it's your ability to present yourself and, and, and convey how good you are for that job. Well, you should know that if you're on LinkedIn and if you're a paying member in LinkedIn, people can leave comments about you that you will never be able to see. So the decision to hire you is not only based on your interaction on that day, but based on data that people left on you without you being able to know what that information is. So you, so you cannot even go to LinkedIn and say, I want that deleted, because you do not know it's there. And we've had several cases of people complaining that they have lost jobs because of those um, secret records only available to paying members. You go to a website, and you might, think, you might think this website just met me. I just opened this, um, um, this link in my, in my browser, and I'm beginning this relationship with this shop or anything. Well, no, because there's cookies that say things about you, and the way this website is going to relate to you is based on this previous information that's already there. So the website already decided who you are and how to, uh, how to relate to you. In, if your identity is stolen, in cases of identity theft, all of a sudden you're still here, but your identity has been kidnapped. So the question is, who are you? Who am I? For you to get an idea of the amount of data that's gathered about us, that's a, a project we did with Jose Luis for the Big Bang Data Exhibition on all the sensors, all the red lights, or the, the red dots are sensors in the city that get data about us. Sorry about that. So going back to the who am I, if my identity is not who I am, if people make decisions based on other things that I've done, things that people think about me, who are you? Well, this is Paris Brown. She applied for a job when she was 17, that was last year. She applied, applied to a job to be the young crime advisor in a UK town, um, and she got the job. She went through the process of um, interviews, and, and she managed to convince the people doing the hiring that she was the right person for the job. She was hired, um, her hiring was announced, she was the first person in the UK ever to play that role, a young person working alongside the police to uh, bring the police closer to younger communities. Then after she was appointed, um, the news picked up on the fact that when she was 14, she tweeted something that sounded as if it was related to drugs. She lost the job. So who is Paris Brown? Is Paris Brown the person who got the job in the first place? Or is Paris Brown the person that tweeted when she was 14? When we make decisions, what do we base those decisions on? And I'll go from Paris Brown to myself. I was thinking when I was preparing this, how can I share with you, how can I get you to visualize how classification happens and the consequences of that? And I decided to use myself as an experiment. So I went on an online dating site, and I did a questionnaire. You know, some of online dating sites give you, you, if you answer some questions, then they tell you, so this is your profile, this is who you are, this is your category, and then based on this, we'll help you find a perfect match. So I did that. I went to OK, OkCupid, 
that has like 16 different kinds of women after you answer the, the questions. I answer the questions, which is the equivalent of those cookies or LinkedIn or um, uh, social networking sites or any other tool gathering your data. In this case, I did it willingly, but it's the same process that happens when you do other things and you leave data. So you're answering questions that someone's posing uh, without knowing. In this case, I knew what I was at, um, answering, and this is what I got. This is me. The only thing I can say is that I'm really glad they gave me a bottle of wine. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the deliberate, gentle love dreamer, which sounds really, really bad. But anyways, um, I've been classified, I've been boxed, I've been caged. Someone took decisions based on my answers and they decided that, that this is what I was. What's interesting about this though is that all of a sudden, my options were limited. Because I was this, the website told me that my exact female opposite, Kenkis Kunt, um, was this, which I think looks really, really cool. Um, and then they also told me to consider the lover boy, which I hope comes with a bottle of wine as well, and to always avoid the five night stain, the false messiah, whatever they are. So based on my, on my profile, they were limiting my options. They were saying, because you are this, now your path needs to go through avoiding this awful woman and going for the lover boy, so, and avoid all the others. So all of a sudden, out of the 16 male characters, 15 were like put outside of my view because I should concentrate on what my profile said I should, um, I should date or, or look for. So in the end, my data double is not only a representation of my identity, but it's also shaping back my identity because I'm gonna behave based on what my data double says about me. And the, the amount of times that there's information that's been missing in this loop is just amazing. And this may sound trivial using OkCupid, but it has broad implications for lots of things. I'll just m mention a few that we're working on. It has implications for politics representation and planning. It is very, easy and it's a lot more comfortable for politicians and policymakers to deal with data doubles than it is to deal with people. Because people are complex, people are messy, people can be annoying, data is stable, data is fixed, data doesn't yell back at you. And so we make decisions based on data doubles and the data, the, the data that we, the tr traces that we leave and not based on actually talking to our constituencies. And we're beginning to see that in real life policy making where politicians decide that I have a, a good enough picture of my constituency using the data so I don't need to attend all those meetings. I don't need to have all those spaces for a direct relationship with, uh, with citizens. The temptation to substitute people with data is really, really high in politics. It can also lead to discrimination. Um, uh, Jared touched about this uh, a bit before. I, I mentioned the example of the bank, how someone decides that you can not have a, um, um, a loan or not, a job, but there's also a discrimination from above, and it's happening more and more, and I'm gonna go back to the example of airports, because that's very useful, and there's really interesting things happening at airports. In airports, you're not discriminated because you're poor, you're discriminated because you're rich. So if you're rich, you're taken away from the mass, and you have different spaces, you go through different routes. So that kind of discrimination is also happening, because discriminating against the poor has ethical implications. They found another way of doing it. You discriminate in favor of the rich and that happens all the time. But there's also other kinds of discrimination. Um, Jerrigans was, ta um, was talking about this project, about oh, where, where people in the world fly. Well, excuse me, where English-speaking people in the world fly. Because I flew to Manchester and I tweeted, I just didn't tweet in English, and I also exist. So there's a lot of data science being based on the English-speaking world, which is not a fair representation of the, of the world. The outbreak of Ebola, for instance, was not picked up by big data because the initial accounts of Ebola were in French. And data science is happening in English. So there's other discriminations beyond rich and poor, which I think need to be um, put on the table. There's this, oh, the, 
how we deal with data also has implications for our sense of self. What does my data say, to, say about me, and do I conform to what my data says about me? Do I try to be the wine drinking woman? Because that's what I've been told I should be. It has implications as well for social mobility, and I'll, and I'll end with this. Can I ever get out of my cage, my data cage? Can, that, can my cage evolve with me? Can my cage forgive? Can my cage forget? I don't know if you've seen the film Eternal Sunshine, Sun, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, it's about the possibility of going to a company and paying to have the memories of your last relationship removed. You want to forget about something that ended badly, that was painful, and so you want it removed. And the whole film is about the ethical problems around that and whether we actually want to forget about, about painful moments. The problem we have these days, it's not what Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was uh, pointing at. The problem we have today is that memory is becoming compulsory. In the same way that Paris Brown lost a job for something she did when she was 14, our life chances and our future decisions are going to be curtailed and limited because of things we did in the past. Will young people who've been tweeting since the age of 12 be able to step into politics freely, knowing that, that everything they did since they were 12 has been recorded and it's probably in the public domain? Will their political options not be limited because of, because of that? So going back to the first question, um, who do you think you are now? And I'll just finish with one idea. What do we do? Well, first of all, meet your data double. Get acquainted with your data double. Find out how your data works and how these profiles are being um, compiled. It's quite interesting because I think that Jerry and I share some similar concerns, but we come to different conclusions. He says, because you know that this is happening, give the data to us because we'll use it ethically to do our projects. What I say is get acquainted with your data double and then sabotage it. Lie about your data. Use a VPN. Distort your image. Only give the right information when it has some value to you. But don't just give it away for nothing. And play with it. And then play with it for several months. And then go on those websites that tell you what the web knows about you. And find out what an amazing distorted image of yourself you're, you're created. I think that as long as we don't have the legal and the technological tools to protect, to protect ourselves and our data doubles, the way to go is sabotage. Thank you.